Hello, and welcome to Intro to Cognitive Science. Today I'm going to be talking to you about systems and heuristics. So this lecture corresponds to the Kahneman reading, uh, which you should have read this week or should be reading this week, and you can either view this lecture before or after doing that reading. But I want you to do both of them and be prepared to uh, know and discuss what's going on in both the lecture and the article itself. Um, I'm broadcasting today from my son's bedroom, so uh, that's why we have the fancy chandelier behind me that looks like an exploding Death Star. Um, I will uh, be recording from various places around the house and at my office on campus throughout this term for these lectures. So, systems and heuristics. Okay, so let's start with a little outline of what we're going to discuss today. So in today's discussion, we're going to first look at the discussion from Kahneman uh, chapter one of system one and system two, and of some related issues that come up here, plasticity, illusions, impressions and beliefs, and then also biases. So we're going to introduce all of these concepts and they'll prove fundamental to what we're going to be doing later on in the class. Additionally, we're going to look at the availability heuristic. Um, so the availability heuristic is one of many heuristics or rules of thumb that we have for navigating the world in a way that um, allows us to make decisions quickly, allows us to make fairly accurate decisions. In other words, allows us to make uh, decisions that are uh, conducive to survival and reproduction. So we're gonna be talking about the, avail the availability heuristic in detail, and we'll mention some other heuristics. And for availability, we're gonna talk about two concepts that relate to heuristics, and so that's availability's bias and also the concept of an availability cascade. And then <clears throat> I'm going to say a little bit about what you're going to be looking at next week, which is essentially going to be uh, looking at modular subsystems of the mind. And so we'll be talking, uh, building a little bit on what we were talking about last time related to human evolution, these kinds of uh, embedded or hardwired, maybe not always hardwired, sometimes they're acquired, but these subsystems that are in some sense automatic within the human mind. So we'll be introducing that concept next week. Okay, so let's get started by talking about the basic distinction between system one and system two. So when Kahneman uses this concept, system one and system two processes, he's engaged in a kind of approach to cognition, which is called a dual process theory. And what a dual process theory is, is it's any theory in cognitive science which alleges that cognition within a certain domain can arise as the result of two processes, typically an automatic process and also a controlled process. So what does it mean when I say within a certain domain? Well, domain is a term that we're going to end up talking a lot about in this term, I mean in this uh, course. Um, and so basically, um, for now, what we can think of as a domain is like a certain target of cognition. So it may be a certain kind of judgment that you make or a certain kind of perceptual domain. Um, for example, uh, perceiving the edges of objects, right? That could be described as a domain. Um, or potentially we could talk about, uh, you know, recognizing word meanings in your native language. Like in each of these cases, that's a kind of task. And so that's basically what we mean by a domain. Now, obviously, different domains can be nested. So we might think of language as a domain, but it also breaks down into different parts, like recognize the, recognizing the meanings of words in your native language, recognizing the grammatical structures that bind them together, and so on. But in any case, back to this idea, dual process theory is a dual process theory is any theory in cognitive science which alleges that cognition within a certain domain can arise as a result of two processes, typically an automatic and a controlled process, okay? And so Kahneman here is introducing us to this basic concept, and he's suggesting that these kind of system one, system two divisions are found across the mind, um, <clears throat> right? So he uh, suggests that there is, are these two kinds of systems which are often represented in mental activity and a lot of the first chapter is spent discussing this. So let's look at what these two kinds of systems are, system one and system two. So recall we're gonna have an automatic and a more deliberate process here. So system one is um, the more automatic process. And here are some things that Kahneman says about system one. 
he says that it operates automatically. He says that it requires little effort. He claimed, he says that it includes innate skills that we share with other animals. So again, uh, getting back to sort of the Harari lecture from last time, the idea that there are these kind of innate traits that make up the human mind. Um, he also says that it can be completely involuntary. Um, that is orienting, so you, we might imagine here like orienting to a, a loud sound. That's a completely involuntary kind of process. If I hear an explosion behind me, <laughs> excuse me, if I hear an expl explosion behind me, I will turn automatically to look and see what that sound was, right? Now, that is a, a kind of behavior, a behavior guided, uh, we might presume, by some kind of uh, brain activity or uh, maybe some kind of mental activity, um, uh, but it, it occurs pretty much uh, involuntarily. Another example, someone speaking words in my native language, um, it seems clearly that understanding the meanings of the meaning of those words is a mental activity, but it occurs completely involuntarily, right? I can't not understand the meanings of words that I hear in my natural language, right? Um, but then there are other, Kahneman says, other system one processes that are susceptible to voluntary control, but they just normally run on autopilot, right? So think about chewing. Well, typically, um, you know, if you're having lunch with a friend or something, you, you would just be chewing and conversing um, and not really paying attention to your chewing, but you might also um, adopt voluntary control over your chewing, like making sure that you do your teeth bite in the appropriate way or something like that. Um, and additionally, system one also, uh, Kahneman suggests, is interrelated with system two in important ways. And, and one thing that he emphasizes is that system one processes are continually generating suggestions for system two. And then um, he also says that it has swift and generally appropriate reactions. Now, I, I want to just say one thing about system one. We're talking about system one and system two as though they are devoted systems, right? But Kahneman's very clear in this chapter that these are like stars of the story that he's going to tell. And in fact, it would be more appropriate to talk when we're talking about the human mind about um, system one systems and system two systems, because there are gonna be a variety of different subsystems that um, realize the processes that we call system one processes and that realize the processes that we call system two processes. That is a variety of different subroutines are going to um, instantiate or make real the system one mind. And similarly, a variety of different processes may make real the system two mind, though we know maybe less about system two in some sense than some system one processes. So let's turn to system two and see what we, uh, you know, at, at a starting point can suggest about it. Well, here's some things that Kahneman says about system two. He says that it allocates attention to effortful mental activities. He says that it's associated with subjective experience, with the subjective experience of agency, choice, and concentration, right? Um, so uh, what have we said about system two so far? Well, we say that it can, you know, direct effortful mental activities, that, that it is, um, the system that allocates attention to effortful mental activity. So imagine reading a poem. A system one process will interpret the understanding of the meanings of those words, but it's going to take a more effortful mental activity, a system two activity, to understand what the poet is getting at, really what is the significance of that poem. So um, we can see how these two, how, how the second process would require more attention and more effort, right? Um, additionally, Kahneman points out that our system two processes are associated with subjective experiences of agency, choice, and concentration, right? So think about understanding that poems. It, poem. It takes no effort to read the words and understand their relation to one another, but you actually do experience yourself thinking about what is the meaning of this poem, right? So that system two process is going to be more experientially rich and feel like something to you as, an, as a mind. Additionally, we can talk about system two as the conscious reasoning self. Um, this is a system that has beliefs, makes choices, and decided, decides what to think about and what to do. 
Um, and it can also construct thoughts in an orderly fashion, in an orderly series, right? So I think what Kahneman is getting at here is that there can be some kind of concatenation between different thoughts in system two. Like I may reason out what to do um, for, uh, you know, what to buy my mother for her birthday, right? Um, and I may think about, uh, well, my mom loves um, clothes, so maybe she would like a, a nice sweater. Um, but then, you know, um, why, why do I think she would like a sweater? Well, maybe it's because she also likes taking trips to cold climates. So perhaps I should buy her a ticket to Colorado. Everyone's been shut up for, you know, months now. So maybe that would be the perfect gift, right? So that follows an orderly process of, of thoughts strung together. It's not really automatic in the way that system one would be. Um, and then an additional thought here is that system two can change the way that system one works. And I think the most uh, compelling uh, examples of this are just thinking about learning new skills, right? So um, I uh, like downhill skiing. Um, when I learned to downhill ski, I was initially uh, very, it was initially very difficult for me. I had to focus on everything I did with my legs. It was clearly a system two process that was allowing me to make it down the mountain. But having skied many times, I lived in Utah for a while, I eventually um, acquired system one processes for judging a mountain and for skiing appropriately down it, right? So what went from this kind of effortful, uh, subjectively experienced uh, um, uh, process of deciding how to turn my legs as I went down the hill became very automatic. It, it pushed into system one. And, and essentially system two gave birth to a new system one process in the course of this. Um, and, and I think uh, another thing that Kahneman mentions with system two is, or to distinguish system two and system one is, well, system one is uh, clearly um, massively, uh, uh, I mean, there, there's clearly a lot of things uh, going on at the same time, right? It, it, system one is clearly um, multi-processing lots of different information at the same time, right? So, I mean, when I'm looking at this computer screen, I'm not only seeing and understanding the words that are printed on it, but I'm also, you know, making out what the edges of the, the text box are, um, assessing, you know, uh, what, what, we, what the light distribution is, what the color is, all of that is gonna be system one processes and they're all happening at the same time. But with system two processes, the mind only has the attention to, um, to, uh, to uh, do a certain amount of these processes at a single time, right? An example that Kahneman uses is if I'm trying to drive a car, and I think this is something all of us who've driven will have experienced, and I have a passenger in the seat, and they're talking to me, and it's distracting me. If I'm trying to execute like a difficult turn, like maybe trying to do some eight point um, uh, roundabout somewhere in the uh, greater Fox Valley and someone's like talking to me about something really interesting, those two things are gonna interfere with one another. I might ask them to be quiet while I execute this turn, turn because uh, these activities don't, they, they'll interfere with one another. So that's another mark of system two. All right, so let's look at system one and two together. Well, I, what I want you to do actually is just to think for a moment so just think, what are some examples of system one cognitive processes? What are some examples of system two cognitive processes? And um, I want you to think about that um, for just a moment. You can pause the video and then uh, we will continue. Okay, so I think that um, maybe uh, some of the things that you identified, and of course you'll have come up with lots of different things here, but, you know, for some possible examples of system one cognitive processes, um, we might have hearing a C-sharp if you're a musician, um, seeing that a, uh, that a box is round is, as a system one process. Um, understanding the words in your native language is a system one process. Uh, assessing the emotional states of others is a system one process. process. We don't have to think about that effortfully um, in cases where we assess their emotional reaction from their face. And then if we want to think about some uh, examples of system two cognitive processes, well, we might think about 
what does someone's action show about their underlying emotional valence, right? Like, why did uh, my wife leave my favorite book out in the rain, right? Like, I could, like, uh, try to think about that and figure out, like, what is the message that's being sent to me there, right? So that might be an effortful system to cognitive process. Um, understanding poetry, working a difficult mathematical problem, right? Um, comparing whether uh, two, two faces uh, look similar to one another, right? All of these might be effortful system to cognitive processes. And I'm sure you came up with lots of others as well. Kahneman, of course, mentions many of these in his book as well. Um, here's a, a telling quote uh, from Kahneman. The capabilities of system one include innate skills that we share with other animals. We're born prepared to perceive the world around us, recognize objects, orient attention, avoid losses, and fear spiders. Other mental activities become fast and automatic through prolonged practice. System one has learned associations between ideas. What is the capital of France? You probably know that immediately. It has also learned skills such as reading and understanding nuances of social situations. Some skills, such as finding strong chess moves, are acquired only by specialized experts, right? So a child learning to read has to deploy system two, uh, but eventually that becomes a system one process. Reading becomes a system one process, right? Understanding the implications of what people say when they're not being direct, um, when they're being passive aggressive, that is a system that starts out as a system two process. Children have to work to understand those nuances, but it eventually becomes system one. So I think it's important to bear in mind here that not all of these systems are innate. Because of the flexibility of the human mind, which we talked about last time, we are also in a position to um, take uh, new skills and to make those uh, automatic processes. In other words, this is to say that the human mind is plastic. The human mind exhibits plasticity. It is able to acquire new subroutines after uh, practice with these new skills in system two. Right, so this is plasticity. This is just the capability. The second half of this is the capability of plasticity, the ability of the human mind to acquire new automatic subroutines. All right. A little bit more in detail here. Um, plasticity, right, in the most general sense, just means the quality of being shapeable or moldable through experience. Um, and in this last quote, I think we can see that plasticity at work when it comes to system one, as I described. And though many system one processes are hardwired, others can be acquired through experience. So this is very important. There are some modular subsystems, and we'll be talking about that word a lot moving forward, um, that are hardwired into us. And there are others that we have acquired through experience and through the active effort of system two. Okay, that's essentially what I said right there. So we're gonna move ahead. Another point to bear in mind about the relationship between system one and system two is the way in which it can give rise to illusions um, and uh, the way it does this is through generating different impressions of how things appear. And ultimately, what is the relationship between uh, these illusions and impressions and belief? So that's something we're gonna talk about now. And, and, and to spur this, I think it's useful to think about this quote from Kahneman. System one continuously generates suggestions for system two, impressions, intuitions, intentions, and feelings. If endorsed by sense of system two, Impressions and intuitions turn in into beliefs and impulses turn into voluntary actions. When all goes smoothly, which is most of the time, system two adopts the suggestions of system one with little or no modification. You general, generally believe your impressions and act on your desires. And that's fine, usually, okay? So the idea here is of a system one that's generating suggestions for system two and we usually adopt those, impre those impressions, those suggestions, um, and that typically works well. So what does he mean by this? Well, think for example, um, that I'm looking across a room and I see that um, the wall is, you know, I, I judge system one, uh, my visual system through experience with the world, 
judges that the far wall is 12 feet away from me, right? Um, in typical cases, uh, that may be correct. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, because I'm well trained with uh, experiences with walking into rooms. And so if I uh, just come to believe, you know, myself as a person, as an individual, that that wall is 12 feet away from me, that'll be no problem, right? So I could sort of endorse that visual assessment there. If someone asks me how far away is that wall, I'll be able to say 12 feet away, okay? Um, maybe a, an even clearer example is if I look at two piles of berries, I can tell, you know, my visual system, system one processes, will judge one of these piles to be larger than the other. And if someone asks me which of those piles is larger, um, I may adopt the suggestion of system one, and indeed it would be appropriate to do that in this case, um, and make the accurate judgment. So that would be system one and system two working correctly together. But there are also instances of illusions. It's possible for system two to be led astray by system one. And it's also possible for system two to reject system one's suggestions. So uh, one case of this is provided by uh, what's called the Mueller liar illusion. This is an illusion that we'll probably reference quite a bit throughout the term. So it's an important one to bear in mind and you've quite possibly already seen it. So here is the basic Mueller liar illusion. So we're presented with these two lines and I want you to tell me, so ignore the pointy parts on the end, just tell me which of those middle lines is longer than the other. Okay. So um, you might now think, if you uh, are in the know about this question, which of those uh, lines, middle lines, looks longer than the other? And I suspect many of you will have said the second line, the bottom line, is the one that looks longer. Um, but in fact, these are both the same size. Uh, the middle lines are. It's just that those arrows, in some way, those pointy arrows, cause the bottom one to look longer than the top one. And I'll say a little bit about what the explanation is and what's going on here in just a minute. But the important thing to bear in mind here is you can reject this belief. You can measure these two lines and see, okay, they're exactly the same size. So you don't believe now that they're the same size. I mean, you don't believe now that the bottom line is longer than the top one. Um, but even knowing that, even having measured these two lines, System one will continue to report that the bottom line, line is longer. That is, the bottom line still looks longer, even though system two knows that to be incorrect. So in some way, the system one process is closed off from global information that we have through belief, right? Like we know that the bottom line is longer, but our visual system keeps reporting uh, sorry, we know that the, the two lines are the same size, but our visual system keeps reporting that that bottom line is longer, right? So this shows something important. It shows that system one is impervious to suggestions from system two, at least in some cases. And now, what explains this illusion in this case? Well, I mean, okay, so we could ask this question, why does system one continue to deliver the same answer? It has something to do with this, with the imperviousness. Um, to background information, but I encourage you to reflect on this question and think about it over the weekend and it'll start building into work that we're seeing uh, related to modularity over the weekend and into next week. Now, I told you I'd tell you why uh, this uh, bottom line appears longer to us and essentially the reason is um, that uh, this bottom line um, looks very similar to environmental stimuli that we're presented with um, in modern homes, okay? So if you think about uh, modern homes and buildings, so if you think about looking across a classroom um, you're standing in, looking towards the far wall, well, um, the far wall will actually, uh, you know, think about the bottom edge of that far wall. It will actually look a little bit like this um, bottom uh, line, right? So imagine that the middle line is the baseline of the floor of the far, far wall. The um, top two arrow lines, right, the two pointing up from the middle line, are the walls ascending from that bottom of the far wall. And the bottom two lines are the walls coming out towards you and the floor coming out towards you from that angle. 
right? So this looks like, and if you look just to the part below sort of the bottom line, it looks very much like um, the, uh, uh, the floor approaching the wall in a room when you're looking out across the room. So one thing our visual system does when we're raised in environments like ours is it learns to adapt and to take the visual uh, stimuli that look like this bottom line and interpret that those are some distance removed from us and that they're actually longer than they appear in vision, right? So our visual system will actually say, well, that's far away from me. And so it's longer than um, it might otherwise appear. So that's why your visual system is, is reporting that bottom line is longer. It's, it's uh, interpreting it as a far wall um, laying far away from you in a room, okay? Um, now, that illusion was um, what we could call a perceptual illusion, right? Your system one perception was delivering some mistaken belief to you. And often we'll talk about perception and cognition. There are some people that don't think this distinction is very real, but I think it's a useful one to us, so um, if, at least to start our discussion from. So our perceptual abilities would include things like our, our capacity to perceive um, visual stimuli, our, our capacity to perceive auditory stimuli, smells, also our capacity to perceive uh, words in our native language and things like that. Um, so it's like perceptual systems for acquiring information from the external world and from our bodies ourselves. And then uh, the cognitive is going to be um, more related to what we've traditionally thought of as thought. So. Um, we can use that distinction here. And if we do use that distinction, then we can say there are also not only perceptual illusions like the Mueller liar illusion, but also cognitive illusions. So consider this guy, right? Um, and Kahneman uh, tells us about uh, a professor of his in, in college in a, in a um, clinical psychology class, or maybe it was a colleague of his, who, um, who uh, reported, okay, you'll sometimes have a clinic or, or have a, a patient come into your clinic who will seem totally charming to you. You'll feel a real connection to this person. You'll feel like you've always known them all your life. Um, and you'll, you'll really feel like you should help this person. If you encounter a patient like that, do not treat them. Um, do not ever see them again. They are a psychopath and they will destroy your life. Okay. Um, so, in this case, the guy on the left may strike you as a charming individual with whom you're likely to become friends, right? Um, but if you're a trained psychologist, you may recognize that this person is a psychopath and reject those errant impressions, right? So this is not a kind of perceptual illusion. This is a kind of judgment I'm making. Oh, this is a trustworthy guy, but it's actually an illusion that's built upon certain emotional factors that a psychopath is capable of exploiting. Psychopaths are known to be, um, one of the defining characteristics is, of psychopaths is superficially charming, right? Um, and so they're very good at manipulating people around them. And in this case, we would have a kind of errant cognitive illusion, a mistaken belief based upon what this person is doing. Okay, so let's turn now to the related issue of bias. Um, so when we talk about these kinds of system one and system two processes, particularly system one processes that make automatic judgments, we can talk about them being biased in various ways. So for example, we might say that the visual system is biased by spatial information about the rooms and buildings in which we um, live in such a way that it falls victim to the Mueller liar illusion. <coughs> or we might say that um, the uh, human, human social system, human emotional systems are biased in such a way that they believe Ted Bundy, the psychopath, is a charming good person. So according to uh, Kahneman, system one has biases, but what are these basically? And I want you to think about that for just a moment. You can pause the video and think if you'd like. Okay, so what are these biases? Um, well, essentially, uh, Kahneman defines biases as follows. He says they're systematic errors that occur in specified circumstances. 
right? So we may be inclined to think of racial bias or gender bias or things like that. But when psychologists and cognitive science and scientists use the notion of bias, they're talking about something much broader. Racial bias and gender bias fall into the category of biases because they're systematic errors, errors of judging people of a different race than your own or people of a different gender than your own. Um, but there are also a wide array of other kinds of systematic errors that our cognitive systems are subject to, and we're gonna call all these things biases. Um, so why are these biases important? Why is it important to study biases? So just like, I'll let you think about that for a moment. Well, for Kahneman, one reason is that they influence our heuristics of judgment in problematic ways. So the fact that I am biased to view shapes that uh, line up in a certain way as far, far uh, corners of walls um, is, uh, leads to certain characteristic problems of judgment. Um, the fact that I am uh, inclined to be uh, uh, to um, like superficially charming people leads to other problems of judgment. So biases are problematic because they lead us to make errors. <clears throat> the work that Kahneman did, and he did a lot of this work with his colleague um, Amos Tversky, who died fairly young. So um, Kahneman is the surviving member of that team, but I don't want to overlook Tversky's excellent contributions as well. The work that Kahneman and Tversky did um, uh, was, um, you know, long lived. They did a lot of work and they covered a lot of different topics. But one of the most important contributions that they made was fleshing out the relationship between heuristics and biases. So the heuristics and biases literature. And this is, um, they, they really pioneered this work and it became critically important to social psychology. So um, let's ask first, what is a heuristic of judgment? Well, according to Kahneman, a heuristic uh, of judgment, um, as he says in uh, chapter 12, the availability heuristic, like other heuristics of judgment, substitutes one question for another, okay? So uh, we know immediately that a heuristic of judgment is a heuristic that involves two kinds of assessments of how things are, two kinds of judgments. Um, and, and what are these two judgments like? One of them gets substituted for the other, but what are they like? Um, well, the, the reason that we have heuristics is that we face difficult questions that it's um, impossible for us or are very, very difficult for us to argue as these kind of finite beings um, who need decisions quickly. And so um, heuristics take those difficult questions and they substitute in easier questions that are somewhat related, that give something like the answer to the question that we want, um, but are much more easy to navigate. So we can make decisions much more quickly with these easier questions. So <clears throat> here's a question. Are you more likely to be a victim of violent crime in Salt Lake City or Chicago? Okay, are you more likely to be a victim of violent crime in Salt Lake City or Chicago? Well, if we actually wanted to judge this question correctly, think of all the information we would need. We would need information about violent crime rates in both of these cities. We need information about population, information about population density. And then we could, uh, you know, um, uh, conduct or, or derive an average, uh, look at the violent crimes per thousand, and make a decision about which of these two is correct. I mean, now much of this is uh, given to us by the internet. And in fact, I just looked up these two cities on the internet to find this out. But if we actually had to come up with this decision ourselves, there'd be a great deal of information that we had to acquire as finite beings, right? Um, especially finite beings living 100,000 years ago, um, uh, when many of these kinds of traits and capacities evolved. Um, many of these heuristics evolved, heuristic responses, we would not have access or not even begin to be able to acquire that kind of information. But we still needed to make kinds of judgments about where to live, about what places were dangerous and things like that. So how did we make those decisions? Um, well, essentially we developed a kind of heuristic and it's called the availability heuristic. Um, we have developed this heuristic for assessing um, likelihood um, that is, 
uh, somewhat tracks what is true, but also is perturbed by uh, irrelevant information. So how might I try to answer this question if I didn't have recourse to the internet? Well, my thought process might go like this. Um, I certainly hear a lot about violent crime in Chicago. It's kind of a political talking point now. Um, uh, so there's always reports when there's ever a violent crime in Chicago. So I'm certainly getting lots of information about violence in Chicago. Um, my stereotype of Salt Lake City, on the other hand, is of a kind of peaceful religious community um, that um, maybe doesn't have some of the problems that Chicago has. There might be some racial reasoning going on here as well, right, if I were making this judgment. Um, so I might uh, make the assessment that Chicago is actually a more violent uh, town than Salt Lake City based on the fact that I hear about more violent crimes in Chicago than Salt Lake City. So I would be in this case using a heuristic to make this assessment, but in fact Salt Lake City has a higher per capita crime rate. What's going on is Chicago is just bigger. It has a whole lot more people in it. And so, um, and it has become the sort of political talking point. So I hear more about violent crime there. So I've been asked to judge, um, are you more likely to be a victim of violent crime in Salt Lake City or Chicago? And what I've actually ended up judging is not that question. I'm, I'm not ended up coming up with an answer to that question, but I've instead, I've answered the question, where do I hear about more violent crime coming from? All right, so I've replaced this more difficult question with this simpler question uh, that I can get an answer to much more quickly. <clears throat> So what is the availability heuristic? It's what's in play here. And essentially what it is, is it's the process of judging frequency by the ease with which instances come to mind, okay? So I'm replacing the question of, um, I'm replacing one question with another. And so what are the two questions? How can we envision the two questions in this case? So we might say something like the following. The difficult question that's getting replaced here is how frequent are X's, right? In this case, we could think of it as how frequent are violent crimes in Chicago compared to Salt Lake City? That's a difficult question. And then the easier question I um, replace it with is how easily can I recall instances of violent crime in Chicago compared to Salt Lake City, All right? Now, um, Availability here then is just the ease or fluidity with which instances of a category are brought to mind, right? True frequency relies upon this probabilistic statistical inform information which is difficult to acquire, but I always have my mind with me. So I can always just run this simulation, just think, well, how easily can I remember cases or, that I've heard about of violent crime in Salt Lake City versus Chicago, right? And um, that's quite easy to do, so I can make an assessment quite quickly using that easy question. So typically at this point, we would have discussion. I'll return to this at, when I uh, do discussion with you this week. So um, the things I want to talk about is what is the role of system one and system two in the availability heuristic? Um, and then why do we use the availability heuristic? And then how does bias arise in the availability heuristic? And so I want us to talk about those things. So I am, though, going to give some provisional answers to these questions. So why do we use the availability heuristic? Well, we rely upon the availability heuristic because we evolved in a situation where, um, um, where essentially because we recall, we evolved in a situation where sometimes not absolutely accurate information was needed. You just needed quick information, okay? So, <clears throat> The fact of the matter is that ease of recall does tend to correlate with frequency, right? So um, if there were no media reports, if the question of violence in Chicago had not become a political hot potato, um, then um, you might just hear reports um, as likely as events actually occurred, right? Let me, let me think of another example to make this clear, right? Um, like, suppose that uh, we're wondering about how often people slip and fall down on icy sidewalks, right? Um, well, uh, if, if we're thinking about um, I, how often do people uh, slip and fall down on icy sidewalks in Appleton, 
Um, we all have local experience with people slipping and falling down on icy sidewalks in Appleton, right? So we may recall those tendencies, um, and certainly it'll be easier for us to recall uh, um, uh, trends or recall instances of people falling down than it would be for someone in um, Little Rock, Arkansas to recall instances of people falling down on ice, right? So it is true that slips on ice are more frequent in Appleton than in Little Rock. And it is true that um, we tend to recall that, that those of us who live in Appleton recall instances of people slipping and falling down on ice more than people in Little Rock do, right? So in fact, frequency does correlate with ease of recall. And additionally, it's much easier to reflect, again, on my internal fluidity of recall than on the actual frequency of events in the world. <clears throat> we might also point, again, as I mentioned before, to a kind of evolutionary psychology point here, which is that, <clears throat> you know, if I was trying to assess um, <clears throat> which of these two uh, mountain valleys to go hunt in as uh, you know, a hominin living 100,000 years ago. Um, and I know that Grog and Schmorg got uh, destroyed by these saber-toothed tigers in Valley B the other day. And I've heard about, I've never heard of anyone getting like attacked by saber-toothed tigers in, Val in Valley A. I can't go out and like survey the area and like find all the saber toothed tigers and tag them and find out like what they're doing at different points and actually make a true assessment. But just having that background knowledge, the ease of recalling the events that um, that saber toothed tiger attacks happen in Valley B more often um, is actually a good tool for making, uh, for allowing me to make my decision in favor of Valley One, right? And it's much quicker. So we need, um, as evolved organisms, not only fairly accurate decisions, but also we need to make decisions quickly in many instances. And so that is the real advantage of a heuristic over the difficult question. Now, the question is, now that we've seen why availability is good, why might it lead us to stray? What are availability's biases? And um, one thing that we can point to here is that while fluidity of recall is influenced by frequency, it is also influenced by things other than frequency. So for example, there can be a narrative. Maybe that's what's taking hold in the Chicago case, kind of political narrative is leading us to think politics is, or really is think that Chicago is more dangerous. Um, that's an outside example. It doesn't actually influence the, in, uh, the frequency of violent crime in Chicago. It's just that narrative is leading us to think this way. Like maybe too, dramaticness and emotion ladenness. Imagine that you've been in a terrible car accident and now you're um, terrified of getting into a car. Part of that may be because you think car accidents are more common because the one you were in <clears throat> is just so emotionally present to you. You're recalling it almost every moment. So there is this kind of fluidity of recall for that instance and that may lead you to judge that they are more common, that these accidents are more common than they actually actually are. Um, there may also be local perturbations in true frequency, right? So I may be wondering how often people get divorced. Um, and, um, you know, as a matter of fact, none of my friends have gotten divorced. So I assume that uh, divorce is actually much lower than it really is. Um, so all of those things will influence ease of recall, but not frequency, and that can lead, lead to problems. Another kind of example that's discussed in chapter 13 is the possibility of an availability cascade. So an availability cascade is a self-reinforcing process of collective belief formation by which an expressed perception triggers a chain reaction that gives the perception increased possibility, plausibility through its rising availability in public decourse, uh, discourse, right? So this is a self-reinforcing process. So what's going on here? Well, think about it this way. Um, there may be a faulty apprehension, uh, there may be an interest in a certain problem, let's say that, an interest in a certain problem, which leads to more news reports of that problem, which leads people to faultily assume that the problem is more, more frequently occurring or of greater scope than was originally thought, which leads to more interest in the problem, which leads to more news reports, which leads to more, um, a, more, a greater faulty apprehension of the scope of the problem. So some examples here, 
um, have been, uh, that are mentioned in the book is uh, um, reactions to uh, Silent Spring, the um, concern about pollution of waters, which um, while a real problem uh, began, uh, you know, hit one of these availability cascades and became, people began to think of it as a much greater problem than it really was. What other instances can you think of in which there is a problem, there are reports, news reports, maybe social media reports of that problem. And then those lead people to think that this problem is actually bigger than it is, which lead to more interest in the problem, which lead to more news reports and so on. Well, I think maybe one example um, that comes uh, to mind here is perhaps gun violence. I mean, gun violence is certainly a real problem but we may tend to think that it's overblown in some cases. Um, I don't know, so that would be a kind of thing to push at. Um, it, there's certainly uh, lots of news reports of shootings. Um, there are a lot of interests. Um, another maybe kind of case um, might be, uh, well, I mean, what would be another kind of example, like uh, discrimination against, um, or, or uh, uh, let's see, persecution of Christians, right? So you could imagine like Christian churches think that persecution of Christians is a real problem in the United States, which leads more people to tell them about these issues. And then that leads them to uh, think there's actually a greater problem here than there is. I don't know. Those are just two possible examples. I invite you to think about this. The, it's really interesting the way in which social media and the news can interact with these and other cognitive capacities though. Okay, so availability cascade. Again, so what are some examples of this? Just spend some time thinking about that. Maybe we can talk about it in class as well. <coughs> okay, so I just want to finish up quickly with some other heuristics that you might be on the lookout for. Um, again, these are heuristics of judgment. So in a certain sense, they involve replacing a difficult uh, question with an easier question. And as we'll see, oftentimes biases arise from this act of replacement. So these um, heuristics include the representativeness heuristic, anchoring and adjustment, and the confirmation heuristic. So I'll talk about the representativeness heuristic. So I want you to think about this. Lin consider Linda. Linda is a 31-year-old, single, outspoken, and very, and Oh, sorry, Linda is 31 years old, single, outspoken, and very bright. She majored in philosophy as a student and was deeply concerned with issues of discrimination and social justice, and also participated in anti-fossil fuel demonstrations. Now, the question is, which is more probable? Linda is a bank teller, or Linda is a bank teller and is active in the feminist movement? Okay. We might also consider another variant on this. Maybe the feminist movement is a bit of a reach. So let's try this. Linda is a bank teller. Linda is a bank teller and did not vote for Donald Trump. Okay, so which is more likely? So I think probably many of you will have judged that the second of these is more likely, that it's more likely that Linda is a bank teller who did not vote for Donald Trump or Linda is a bank teller who is active in the feminist movement than that she is the ba just a bank teller. But if you did think that, and many people do when these kinds of experiments are administered, um, if you did think that, then you're falling victim to uh, the conjunction fallacy, which is the fallacy where you think that two conjoined ideas are more likely than a single one, right? A way to put it is this, if Linda is a bank teller and is active in the feminist movement, then she is a bank teller. But maybe there's also other possible situations where Linda's political views changed after college and she's merely a bank teller, right? Um, so if that's the case, then um, the more likely outcome is that she is just a bank teller. Anytime she's a bank teller and active in the feminist movement, she is a bank teller, right? So um, clearly Linda as a bank teller has to be at least as likely, or the first instance has to be at least as likely as the second um, instance, and is probably more likely. So what's going on here? Well, we're falling victim to the representativeness process, and that's just the process of judging the likelihood that some state of affairs obtains in a given situation by judging the degree to which the situation is representative of stereotypical situations in which that state of affairs is typically thought to obtain, right? So <clears throat> what's going on here is it seems like the idea of Linda being a bank teller and active in the feminist movement 
is more representative of what's told to us about Linda. So we're judging that that is the more likely outcome. So again, we're, we're judging how likely is a certain outcome and we're replacing it with this easier question, which one fits my stereotype better? Okay, so that's a representativeness heuristic. Another heuristic is called anchoring and adjustment. And so this is just, just the process of judging what an appropriate numerical value is by judging what is a more appropriate numerical value than some initial given value. And so the extra info here may be super, superfluous. So um, an experiment of this uh, is the following. A study by Dan Ariely, an audience was first asked to write the last two digits of their social security number and consider whether they would pay this number of dollars for items whose values they did not know, such as wine, chocolate, and computer equipment. They were then asked to bed, bid for these items with the result that the audience members with higher two-digit numbers would submit bids that were between 60 and 120% higher than those of the lower social security number, which had become their anchor, right? <coughs> so the last two digits of your social security number are irrelevant to how much a variety of different products cost. But if we're judging how much those products cost, we'll often rely upon whatever numerical information we have available to us. And, and even if that's irrelevant information, such as the last two digits of our social security number, right? So um, as you can see, this is another instance of replacing a difficult question with an easier one. Another example of a bias this is just a bias here, not a heuristic, is um, confirmation bias. Um, and we might call confirmation a heuristic. We might say there's a confirmation heuristic. And what that heuristic would look like is the process of judging which information is correct or which, which course of action is best by judging how strong a case I can make for what I already am inclined to accept, right? <clears throat> so imagine you're trying to decide what is actually the best thing to do in a case. That requires you to get beyond your personal opinions and think about this from an objective point of view. That's difficult, that's a hard question. So the easier question is, how much evidence can I quickly acquire that supports what I'm already inclined to accept anyway, right? <clears throat> or can I acquire enough information to reaffirm what I already believe anyway, right? So the bias here is that we tend to seek out information that confirms our opinions. Um, there's a famous study in which this heuristic is seen, uh, or which this confirmation bias is seen. So people write down an argument for some opinion, uh, go away for two weeks, then come back and are told either that this is what they wrote or that it's what some other participant wrote. People are much better at pointing out holes in the reasoning of people who, uh, holes of the reasoning of the same argument when they believe it was written by someone else than when they believe it was written by themselves. So we have a tendency, it seems, to um, favor our own opinions, even if we don't, um, you know, even if those opinions are what we would have adopted anyway, right? So I mean, what's going on here is it's something the person has written already, and yet just because they think it's someone else's words, they're finding holes in it. So we're not even really sensitive to our own opinions when we're engaged in this practice. All right, some key questions going forward. What features much of, must a cognitive system capable of system one processes have? Next week, we're gonna be looking at what some of those features may be as we move into the modularity literature. Another question is what features must a cognitive system capable of system two processes have, <clears throat> right? So we have said a lot about um, kind of these uh, system one, system two relations uh, processes here. We said a lot about, sorry, the system one processes, and we'll think a lot about those next week, but I want you to continue to think about what system two must be like as well. It seems like much less is known about system two at this point than system one, um, but we'll have some conjectures about what system two must be like by the end of this first section of the class. And then another question is, are those features different from one another? So to what degree does the underlying architectural structure of system one processes differ from system two processes. And that will push us ultimately to consider how firm of a distinction between system one and system two is actually plausible. But this uh, distinction that Kahneman has proposed so far is a good place to start for us looking at our model of the mind. <clears throat> so 
As I mentioned, next week we're going to be looking at the modularity of mind. And the idea here is basically that a mind, just like a body, is an evolved system. And just as bodies have um, <coughs> distinct uh, organ systems to uh, uh, realize different processes within them, it's presumably the case that minds do as well. They have subsystems that do individual subtasks that minds have to complete. Um, one account of what these subsystems are describes them as modules. And for next week, you'll be reading Robin Karsten on modules. She identifies a number of key properties of modules. So for your homework, and this is gonna be due at 9 a.m. on 9.23, so that's next Wednesday, I want you to type your own brief definitions of the following three properties of modules. Domain specificity, informational encapsulation, and mandatoriness. Then I want you to identify a cognitive process that exhibits these properties and explain why. So for example, after formulating your definitions, you may identify recognizing the meaning of words of your native language as a process that is domain specific, informationally encapsulated, and mandatory. I think it's important here to think small. Um, <clears throat> do not say simply language, vision, or motion is domain specific, informationally encapsulated, or mandatory. Rather, try to, to identify a small component of language, vision, or motion that is modular. Explain why. That is, what is the domain that this process specifically attends to? What proprietary information is encapsulated within the mechanism that underlies this process? And in what conditions is this process's operation mandatory? And I want you to do all this in no more than 200 words on the relevant Moodle forum. All right, that's it. This is your last uh, lecture for uh, week one. I will be getting these up earlier next week, and I look forward to talking more with you about this stuff. Have a good day.